Hi, good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining tonight. Uh, my name is Lauren Gilbert. I'm the Senior Manager for Public Services at the Center for Jewish History, which is the collaborative home for five partner organizations that together form the largest archive on the modern Jewish experience outside of Israel. And I would like to thank one of those partner organizations, the American Jewish Historical Society, uh, for co-sponsoring tonight's event with us. And thanks to all of you for joining. Um, just the usual uh, housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, you'll see that the chat is disabled for participants. So please put your questions in the Q&A box. No need to raise your hand. Um, we'll get to questions at the end, but you can type them in as you go along. Today's program is being recorded and will be available on the center's webpage and YouTube page within a few weeks. Um, if you registered for this event, you'll receive an email with the link to the recording. Um, our plan for tonight, our uh, author and interviewer will have a conversation and then uh, we'll show uh, some slides and then we'll go to the audience Q&A. Um, and the book under discussion tonight is the latest title from the Jewish Lives series, which is a partnership of Yale University Press and the Leon D. Black Foundation. Um, Jewish Lives is a prize winning series of biographies uh, designed to explore the many facets of Jewish identity with different volumes that illuminate Jewish figures from all fields and throughout history. Um, you should have received a link and a code for 25% off the book that um, we're discussing tonight, plus free shipping. Um, I, I will put it again in the chat during the program, just in case. Uh, all right, so let me introduce our speakers. Um, our author tonight, Mark Wortman, is an independent historian and freelance journalist. He's the author of four books on American military and social history. His most recent book bef before this one, uh, 1941, Fighting the Shadow War, A Divided America in a World at War, appeared in 2016. He is also the author of The Millionaire's Unit, The Aristocratic Flyboys Who Fought the Great War and Invented American Air Power. A prize-winning feature-length documentary based on the book is available on streaming services. Um, as an award-winning freelance journalist, he has written for many publications, including Vanity Fair, Smithsonian, Time, and The Daily Beast. He has spoken to audiences throughout the country and has appeared on CNN, NPR, C-SPAN, Book TV, History Channel, uh, and other broadcast outlets. He has taught at Princeton and Quinnipiac Universities. Following college at Brown University, he received a doctorate in comparative literature from Princeton University, and he and his family live in New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, the book we are discussing tonight, Admiral Hyman Rickover, Engineer of Power, was just published and received a glowing review in the Wall Street Journal just the other day. Um, and he will be in conversation with Rabbi Bruce Kahn, who received ordination from Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion in 1974. As part of the U.S. Navy Theological Student Program, he was commissioned in Ensign in 1970. He retired as a U.S. Navy captain in 2002 and was called back in 2003 and sent to the Iraqi theater. He has received many medals and commendations during his naval career. In the 1980s, as a ready reserve chaplain attached to National Naval Medical Center in Bethesda, Rabbi Khan got to know Mrs. Eleanor Rickover during a period of time when the Admiral was often a patient there, a bond which continued until her recent passing. Uh, he is also the Rabbi Emeritus of Temple Shalom in Chevy Chase, Maryland, and a founder and former executive director of the Equal Rights Center in Washington, DC. On October 11th, 2001, he was the only rabbi asked to co-officiate at the Pentagon's 9-11 memorial service. In 2011, the Washington Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and Urban Affairs presented Rabbi Khan with the prestigious Alfred McKenzie Award for a lifetime of civil rights advocacy. He and his wife, Toby, have been married for 53 years and they have two children and three grandchildren. So uh, thank you both for joining us. I am going to turn off my camera for a bit and turn the uh, discussion over to you. Thank you, Lauren. That was terrific. So Bruce, you have a question. I have lots of questions. <laughs> Enough <laughs> questions for days. Um, yeah. But uh, let me uh, kind of frame, if I can, try and frame the entire discussion. Uh, first of all, Mark, what a privilege to have read your book, um, such an Thank outstanding you. work on the Admiral 
as uh, Mrs. Rickover always referred to him. Uh, you make such a compelling case that this man, so powerfully unique, may well be the most consequential admiral in the history of the United States and perhaps in naval history worldwide. You also make the case that at a very precarious time in the Cold War, at the dawn of the atomic age, Hyman Rickover changed the world in our favor as no one else on the planet could. <clears throat> Excuse me. This amazing thing is that, the amazing thing is that the claims that I've just put out are not even slightly hyperbolic. Would you elaborate for us <clears throat> on the Admiral's importance? What do we most need to understand about his amazing contributions? Okay, well, well, thank you, Bruce. Thank you for the, the kind words about the book. Um, so let's start with where we were after World War II. So nuclear fission, the splitting of, of the atom, uh, equaled the bomb. World War II had uh, ended with the uh, with the bombing with the dropping of the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So, in the entire world's eyes, the atom equaled the bomb, and ships and submarines at that point uh, sailed, steamed on fossil fuels or sails. Essentially, uh, there was uh, they required refueling. They required, uh, they needed to carry massive amounts of fuel with them uh, wherever they went. Now, uh, Rickover wanted to create a practical nuclear reactor. He wanted to take nuclear fission, uh, which was equivalent to the bomb, and encase it within uh, steel and metal, shielding it, uh, and set it inside a, a submarine or a ship's hull. You know, on the surface, this was a crazy idea. And he accomplished it within five years of starting the program to do that. He actually put a submarine to sea with a, with a, um, a reactor as its power plant. Now, um, what can I, that can I just say, can I, before you go on, just say, yeah. <laughs> that is Im almost impossible to grasp what you just yeah. said in five years uh, from, yeah. uh, and we're not talking about taking a, a vessel that's already designed and the engineering problems already mm -hmm. solved and, yeah. and, and, uh, put together and I'd say, and now we're just going to make a copy of it in five years. Yeah. That's yeah. not what you just said. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he literally had to create an entire industry from scratch. And that industry had to develop metals that didn't exist. That industry had to develop uh, this chemistry and physics of a nuclear reactor that essentially didn't exist. They had to figure out how to exchange heat uh, to, in the simplest terms, uh, a nuclear reactor boils up uh, water within it or some other flowing liquid. That flowing liquid is massively radioactive within the reactor. It then goes to an, uh, a metal transfer plate that sends it into another coolant line, uh, another line of water, but that gets boiled up into steam and drives a turbine. So that's how you power a ship or a submarine or a utility with, uh, with nuclear power. But to say that is to say just the smallest bit of what it took to actually engineer that. Not only engineer it, because you can engineer it in a massive frame, uh, which is what you would think of uh, primarily as a as a utility, and there were uh, experimental reactors that were being done. But you had to engineer it and miniaturize it and contain it, uh, and all, all that radiation with the inside a hull, where 
men were roving around and you had to do that without releasing any radiation into the surrounding environment. You know, Rick Over said, I want to, I want to, I have a son. I love my son. I want my reactors to be so safe that if my, that I would trust my son to be on these vessels. Um, that was an extraordinary thing to do. And he also understood uh, in a way that um, sadly many others didn't, that if you, uh, if you have a nuclear accident and release radiation into the environment, you're gonna poison the environment for 30,000 years. You can't do that and expect to be able to continue to, uh, to have a nuclear program. My, sorry, my dog keeps walking in and out of here. Barney, get out of here. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so he, he set up a program. It wasn't just that he created a nuclear reactor. He had to uh, educate and train sailors to become nuclear engineers and to be able to operate this is an incredibly complex machine. So in addition to this, this uh, development of this nuclear reactor, he also had to find a way to train and choose and develop young men who could handle the intricacies of this. Now, uh, this involved a revolution within the Navy. Yeah, the Navy had for its, uh, for, for its entire history, there was a statement that I think is, is emblazoned at, in Annapolis at the Naval Academy. It said, um, supposedly the uh, qualifications of a Naval officer that uh, came down from uh, John Paul Jones, the founder of the Navy. An officer, officer should be a gentleman of liberal education, refined manners, punctilious courtesy, and the nicest sense of personal honor. Now, none of that language, including personal honor, uh, would ever have been ascribed to Rickover. And he didn't, he didn't care. He wanted people who could run this gigantic, dangerous machine and do it right. And the result was that we are now uh, almost 65 years after the, uh, the Nautilus, the first nuclear powered ship went to sea, there have been more than, probably more than 7,000 years of nuclear reactor operations on these naval vessels. And there has never been a nuclear accident in an American naval vessel. In operating in the most fierce conditions on earth, never once. And go compare that to what the Soviets and the Russians did, and you'll see what he accomplished. So it didn't. It, so uh, we need to go back just a little bit. This did not happen in any kind of normal Navy or government way of doing business. Admiral mm -hmm. Rickover turned the United States Navy on its head, and he just completely went, did something, did things contrary to all the established ways by which the Navy operated. Yeah. Can you tell us some of that? Yeah. Um, so Rickover was the, in many ways, the antithesis of that John Paul Jones qualifications of a Navy officer. Uh, Rickover was uh, he, he was a street tough from Chicago, uh, started out as uh, um, born in a shtetl in Poland uh, in just before the turn of the century. And um, at age six, came over to the U.S. not speaking a word of English, moved uh, with his family to Chicago, grew up there working incredibly hard. He worked from the age of nine, almost full time while going to school. So this was a kid who was as tough as could be, uh, uh, hard as nails. But he was, you know, he was five, at, as a full grown adult, he was five feet, six inches tall, 125 pounds. Um, 
you know, the antithesis of, uh, of Mr. Roberts or uh, any other naval officer you can think of uh, in, the, uh, in the Hollywood and previous Naval Academy perspective. He, so he came through a Naval Academy that had very little interest in what you could learn. They wanted to cram you full of memorization, rote learning that you could basically spout back and figure out um, you know, how to operate your ship. The, the, Navy, the Navy perspective was that any officer could move from one billet to another, one command to another. And Rickover was somebody who didn't believe in that. He believed that you had to work hard and you had to get a good education and you had to understand what you were doing. Taking that as his sort of basic uh, basis, he forced the Navy by dint of will, by uh, a toughness and a willingness to fight to the end for anything he believed in. And in some cases, what he believed in was his own power, that he wanted to have power over the program because he didn't trust anybody else to do it. And also because he liked doing what he was doing. So he fought people tooth and nail to hold on his power. And he didn't believe in some of the very basics about the Navy, which included rank. He didn't care about rank. He didn't care uh, within his domain. He didn't care about rank. He said there was no, there's no uh, hierarchy of, of the mind. And then he didn't care about the chain of command in the Navy. If he wanted to get something done, he went around people. He went through them until he could get it done. And Bruce, you're an officer in the Navy. I Tell am. me whether I this am. is. <laughs> no, know, so, this is so, so there, so there, 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 are, there are lots of impossibilities in the Admiral Rickover story. Um, when it comes to uh, frequent and really gross violations of of the uh, chain of command and uh, matters of insubordination um, that are covered in the uh, Uniform Code of Military Justice, particularly in Articles 88 through 92, for somebody to violate, and we'll go into some examples, uh, and I'm sure you'll, you'll share with us some examples, mm -hmm. um, but, uh, to violate these articles is the antithesis of how a military functions. It can't function that way, except under a rickover. Um, mm -hmm. It can't do that. It's not a democracy. Uh, if you're uh, ordered to go to battle, you don't stop and take a vote or somebody said, well, I really, not today. That's not how it works. Uh, this is serious stuff. And, and Admiral Rickover, long before he was an admiral, from the time he was a lieutenant on, um, did not uh, abide by the basic rules, regulations, culture of the Navy. And I want us to, we've got to understand how he was able to survive doing that. Nobody that I've ever heard of, no one else, ever, anybody could have survived what he survived. And not only survived, but wound up with four stars and an absolutely indelible place in naval history. And I believe he should uh, also have an indelible place in American history and in, in the history of the 20th century. So how did he do that? Um, how, well, and we, we can should, tell we should, remind, we should remind people that that he survived from 1918 when he entered the Navy under President Woodrow Wilson until 1981, uh, entered at the end of the First World War and survived until 19 as an active duty Navy officer until 1981. Now, just uh, give, nobody give, does that. No one does that. Nobody stays 63 years on active duty. So just go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So how did he do it? He did it because he got things done. 
He got things done and that won him friends in high places. So first, going back to World War II, right back to World War II. In World War II, he was a head, head of, a, of a component of the Navy Bureau of Ships in charge of electrification aboard all of the Navy ships. You're talking about you know, over 100,000 ships that were built during World War II, phenomenal number of ships, everything from Higgins boats to uh, aircraft carriers. And Rick Oversection was in charge of making sure the electrical systems on these ships operated. And he did some extraordinary things um, and uh, to accomplish that. Um, uh, both the, uh, he installed uh, red lighting on ships. He uh, got rid of shattering um, uh, light bulbs. He, uh, for the first time they had circuits that could be hit by shells and continue to operate. So it was a, uh, you know, which in the midst of a battle meant saved countless lives, countless lives. But he also went around the chain of command. He had, uh, he uh, purchased uh, a mine sweeping system to get uh, that worked far better than what the Navy uh, had in place. And he didn't wait for his superiors to approve the order. He went and ordered it from, I think it was General Electric himself and said, you know, uh, you'll either do it for me because they wanted to get the purchase order from, the, um, from his higher ups. And he said, you'll either do it for me or you'll never get another contract. And so they did it. And that was fairly typical of what he did. The fact is, it, uh, he was going to get in trouble. He was going to lose his job. And then the higher up said, my God, it works. It's a much better system than what we have. You know, you know, we're not going to we're not going to uh, uh, we're not going to fire him. We're going to give him an award for this. Now, that that process kind of continued during uh, when at his uh, in World War Two at this section, he, he banned uniforms in there. He banned uniforms. This was a Navy guy. These were all, uh, there were Navy people working for him. He told, he told them under no certain uncertain terms, don't come to work in a uniform. You can't wear a uniform. You're engineers. The engineers don't wear uniforms. Now, every day in every command, you receive mm -hmm. a POD, the plan of the day. And first mm -hmm. item, well, one of the first items is the uniform of the day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so Rick over notoriously, notoriously wore his Navy uniform only on the most ceremonial occasions and usually only on those occasions when he wanted to impress. He received his, he received le um, medals of uh, merit from the Navy pinned on to a business suit. And he would go he would testify at Congress. Once he started becoming better known, Congress loved the guy. And this is where we get to where his power came from. So Congress would invite him up to testify. And when you're testifying as a Navy officer, the, you are ordered to wear your uniform when you go to Capitol Hill, to go to, into, those, uh, into those committee rooms. Rickover never wore his uniform to testify. And when ordered, he would say, what are you going to do about it? And they couldn't do anything about it. At one point, Robert McNamara threatened to court-martial him. He went in to see Mendel Rivers, one of Rickover's supporters, Mendel Rivers. He said to Rivers, I'm going to court-martial him. And Rivers said, well, you know, who was this very, very powerful congressman from South Carolina, who was a big backer of, of the Navy, and Mendel Rivers said to uh, McMurray, he said, well, uh, you can go ahead and try to do that, but you're going to have the entire House and the entire Senate and all the Jews and all the Catholics, Catholics and probably all the American people opposed to you, but you can go ahead and do it. And uh, McMurray got up and walked out of the room. So, um, so that's yeah. a great example of the, you know, the, 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 the meaning of this, um, of your book 
when you called it Admiral Hyman Rickover, engineer of power, there's nuclear propulsion power. There's uh, the power in, the, in his uh, command. There's the power mm -hmm. with industry and there's power on the Hill and the White House. Yeah. And he yeah. mastered that as no one else ever did. And I, I, want to, uh, I, I want to just for a second, go back to uh, his importance mm -hmm. because of what he did at the time that the Soviets were starting to get involved in developing nuclear propulsion for their own ships was to thwart the Soviets and their plans for domination and to control the seas mm -hmm. and to preserve, to allow the United States to have this, this technical superiority and to be able to preserve freedom of the seas. Not everybody gives a lot of thought to freedom of the seas, but if you don't have freedom of the seas, your world is in enormous trouble and cannot continue to function the way that you expect. Yeah. Rick yeah. Over's contribution is in, in along those lines, and you say it in your book, is to, is to me impossible to, uh, the importance of that, impossible to overstate. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, um, you know, let's let's take our contemporary moment right now. We have um, confrontations uh, with the potential for conflict, uh, armed conflict even, with uh, the Russians, and uh, in now in in Eastern Europe, Ukraine, and with the Chinese in the South China Sea and Taiwan. You know, this is a dangerous situation, but one thing assures that nobody will engage in an active direct conflict between uh, these great powers. And that's our nuclear vessels. We have nuclear ships that are plying the seas. Nuclear, we have an all nuclear carrier fleet. We have uh, close to 100 submarines operating that carry both uh, missiles and uh, torpedoes. And I was talking actually yesterday with some um, Cold War Navy um, uh, commanding officers of submarines. And they said to me, you know, we knew where the Soviets were. They didn't know where we were. And that's, that's a tremendously powerful, powerful statement uh, when you are in, uh, in playing these cat and mouse games and when you are, uh, carrying on a kind of brinksmanship uh, with uh, low level conflicts that could always escalate. But you have this, the, the, this is a preventive weapon that, that the submarine in particular that prevents anybody from attacking us because it would be suicide. It would simply be suicide. And then on top of that, creating uh, the nuclear propulsion for aircraft carriers means that you can travel uh, to crisis spots worldwide. It gives uh, the um, uh, Washington uh, enormous power to project or the ability to project power to crisis spots around the world. These ships can go anywhere. They don't have to go into port. They can remain on station. Uh, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, we had nuclear powered ships at uh, surrounding Cuba and they uh, and the Nautilus, uh, the first nuclear powered submarine was under the water there shadowing the Soviet vessels as they returned with the missiles that they were trying to station in Cuba. Now, um, not everybody watching tonight is really clear about the difference that nuclear uh, ships um, make. And you started to talk about it <clears throat> when you said that the pre, the, all the, the ships that aren't nuclear, they have to uh, carry lots and lots of fuel and mm -hmm. they have to uh, uh, carry 
um, and they have to carry a whole lot of other items, uh, machinery and parts that <clears throat> the uh, nuclear fleet does not have to carry. Um, mm -hmm. When it comes to how long, and you said they can stay on station. So I think it's important to say, just to make clear to everybody, that when you're talking about a nuclear ship, you're talking about, and when you're talking about a nuclear submarine, you're talking about a vessel that creates its own power, creates its own air, mm -hmm. creates its own water, and the only times that it needs to surface um, and on to put into port is to get resupplied with food and to give the crew some R and R, because yeah. if you, you can't stay submerged forever, but they'll stay submerged for sixty to ninety days. That's not unusual at all. Yeah. So yeah. the the qualitative change, the environmental change that Rickover created with these ships and this ability to project force to go quickly and without any kind of interruption anywhere mm -hmm. is, we, we, we wouldn't have had it. We wouldn't have had it without him. Yeah, you know, Rickover said what, when, when the Nautilus went to sea, underway on nuclear power the first, uh, for the first time, uh, he said, we can now go where we want, when we want. And uh, that was actually demonstrated uh, quite definitively when the uh, dream of man, uh, ever since there was an awareness of, of, uh, of the uh, polar ice cap, uh, when the Nautilus in 1958, uh, submerged uh, off of Alaska and then uh, went all the way under the, uh, the North Pole and exited and re, uh, resurfaced near Greenland. You know, this was an unbelievable achievement. And when we think about that moment, so we're in the midst of the Cold War, the Soviets had already launched Sputnik. The US, uh, US rocketry, had by and large failed up to that point. We were uh, well behind the Soviets. And uh, for, uh, that meant that the Soviets, uh, people were in terror because they thought, you know, they're gonna be able to put a nuclear warhead on a rocket. They're gonna be able to launch it and, and, and aim it at the heart of the United States. And suddenly we were able to both uh, demonstrate this incredible machine. This was the most advanced, technologically advanced machine in the world and then demonstrate that we could actually send that right up to the northern shores of the Soviet Union. And that eventually there was an understanding that this was going to become a weapons platform, uh, that it was going to carry missiles and that the Soviets could not without, with uh, impunity launch missiles at the United States because we might have our missile toting submarines lurking off their shores. So this, this was uh, a, a revolution, a true revolution. It was a revolution in strategy. It was a revolution in tactics. Uh, and it was uh, a, a change in uh, an entire paradigm of thinking about how you use uh, a Navy. We haven't even mentioned that at the same time he did this, Rickover uh, was creating the world's first nuclear uh, atomic uh, uh, utility, all uh, the first civilian power generating plant using nuclear power. Uh, he at shipping port uh, above Pittsburgh, he took uh, what was originally intended to be a, um, a ship reactor for a large ship um, and uh, reworked it, uh, which was actually a tremendous amount of engineering. And in 1957, it began illuminating Pittsburgh and it continued for several decades. You know, this is- There's so much that's impossible to really wrap your head around concerning him and that he was able to do this, you know, do all these things simultaneously mm -hmm. is just, it's really inconceivable. 
this revolution that you talk about. Can, can we just take a couple of minutes to talk about how none of that uh, might have happened if small, relatively small things along the way had not taken place, starting with his entry into the United States and later with his entry into the Naval Academy? Sure, okay. So um, uh, Rick Over, as, as I said earlier, was, uh, was in many ways a, a classic uh, Jew of, of the uh, pale. He uh, uh, was born in Macau, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, Poland and Russian Poland, a shtetl um, about uh, 60 miles, I believe, above Warsaw. Uh, he, his family was quite poor. Um, his father came over to the US ahead of his mother and sister and, and, uh, and Rick over. Um, um, his, born, his birth name was Chaim Godalia Reichauer or Reichover. Um, and six years later, uh, his father had made enough money and brought his, uh, his uh, two children then, he, they eventually had another daughter, uh, over to, um, to meet him in New York. When they got to Ellis Island, his mother had been swindled on the passage over. They were in steerage. Uh, uh, a porter said, uh, you'll have to uh, send a telegraph to um, uh, head to, uh, so you'll be met at Ellis Island. That was her last money of this kind of epic journey they had made. Um, she had no more money. The, the telegraph was either never sent or uh, it never got to her husband. Uh, he didn't show up there. And a, a woman unaccompanied could not enter the United States. So she and her two children waited for 10 days at Ellis Island to be able to come into the United States. At the last minute that literally, uh, I think in the slideshow we'll see that there is deported, stamped on his, uh, on the ship's manifest for the three uh, Rickovers there that they were gonna be sent back they were just hours away from being sent back. Rickover was brought into, uh, Rickover's father got word that they were waiting for him at the last moment and, and arrived and brought them in. Incidentally, um, as with hundreds of, of shtetls, uh, the, the entire population, entire Jew, Jewish population was wiped out. How many Rickovers, how many other Rickovers died uh, at the hands of the Nazis? Absolutely. And then, <clears throat> so, except for that very unlikely, uh, timely scenario, then he never would have gotten in. He would have been deported and sent back. Um, and what about his entry into the Naval Academy? Yeah, so- uh, He Rickover, was not uh, what you would call the typical uh, midshipman. No, no. So Rickover, you know, I-, I other than um, his uh, arrival aboard the, uh, the Finland uh, at Ellis Island, I doubt he ever had been on a, uh, was on a boat again. Uh, he probably never even saw Lake Michigan uh, when he was living in Chicago. Uh, but he was, a, uh, he was a passionate student. He, uh, and he would, uh, would have loved to continue his education. It was entirely out of the question, he was gonna work. Uh, just as he had already been doing while he was in school. I always regretted that he couldn't learn more in high school because he spent so much of his time working, uh, doing work, uh, delivering telegrams. Well, it happened that a cousin of his was owed a favor by a donor to one of the, uh, to the local congressman. And uh, that favor, uh, was cashed in when the congressman nominated Rickover to the Naval Academy. Now, uh, Rickover was, as you said, sort of the unlikeliest midshipman, but he managed by, um, you know, sheer grinding uh, to get through the test, barely made it past uh, uh, the entry level, uh, and what went into the Naval Academy. Um, and when he went there, there were, um, 
I think in his entering class, the plebe class, there were 17 Jews um, out of about 900 uh, plebes. It was the largest plebe class in history because of World War I. They thought they were going to need a lot more officers. Well, um, while he was there, uh, not surprisingly, um, Jews were not well looked upon, were not well treated. He once got into a fight, and as he said, I got the crap beat out of me. Um, he, um, well, and he uh, got into the fight because another, another uh, midshipman uh, attacked, said, made an anti Semitic statement to Rickover. Yeah. And he challenged him instead of to a duel with guns or sabers uh, with fists. Yeah. And yeah. Rickover got pummeled. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we should say, you know, Rickover was raised. An Orthodox Jew, Bar Mitzvah, um, uh, went, uh, you know, at the in the shtetl. He they went to uh, he went to a cheder, um, uh, but uh, once he got to the navy, he basically abandoned. It was impossible to keep kosher. Um, he actually changed his middle name to uh, George. Um, some people, uh, some very uh, his intimates, including his future wife, called him George. Um, uh, very few people called him Hyman. Some people called him Rick. Um, and those who hated him called him uh, and were anti-Semitic called him Jaime. Um, one, one, uh, an another admiral said of him, when they circumcised him, they threw away the wrong end. <laughs> you know, they, they, this, there was plentiful anti-Semitism within the Navy, but it was, it was no different than the rest of American society. But the one thing that they did do at the Naval Academy was they had, all Jews, they said, lived in Coventry. Now this was um, their term for the silent treatment. Jews were not spoken to. They lived, uh, uh, the other midshipmen almost never spoke to them uh, except to issue orders uh, or uh, when they had to work together. So these were these were difficult times, and Rickover began to develop a chip on his shoulder. He he hated the Navy. It's sort of hard to imagine that he spent sixty three years in the Navy and he hated it. You know, there was one that uh, uh, there was one time he was um, out with uh, one of his aides driving through the Connecticut countryside, presumably after having gone to. Um, uh, one of the facilities that he had set up in Connecticut for submarines. And he says, said to the, um, to the guy, uh, to his aide, he said, you know, you treated you like trash. You better watch out. He's going to do something. And Rick over did something. And he, he went through that entire career with deep, deep anger. Yeah. I would like to, um, there's so much that's paradoxical about him. And you just hit on one of the biggies, which is his animosity towards aspects of the Navy mm -hmm. and his uh, ironclad fierce loyalty and determination to make the Navy succeed. Yeah. So, th so, so uh, that is, uh, that's one of, one of the um, paradoxes about mm -hmm about his, uh, his, his career. Um, he was also, he was this, he could be really, and you know extremely well how, uh, from all your research, how harsh he could be towards mm -hmm. people. And at the same time, he was somebody who made sure that everyone in his environment, including people that normally wouldn't uh, be given a lot of consideration, uh, mm -hmm. such as uh, the um, many of the lower level secretaries that worked uh, in his, and by the way, he, we need to say he created an empire. It wasn't just a command like in a building or two buildings or three buildings. We're talking about a vast empire that uh, nuclear uh, reactors uh, was um, uh, cr that he created with the creation of nuclear reactors. Um, so, uh, so he would he he believed, and you've referred to it before, that everybody was 
vital, but they had to seek perfection. And there was mm -hmm. no other standard that would be tolerated. But when yeah. people met his expectations, um, then there was like magic in the relationship. How, 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 how do you understand this opposition, this fierce opposition to him by so many and this fierce loyalty, loyalty to him by others? Yeah, yeah, that's, um, that's a great question. And, um, you know, Rickover uh, was creating uh, um, a technology and giving people responsibility. And if you couldn't take that responsibility and, and uh, work with it and love it and, and think that you had a tremendous mission in your life, you, would, you wouldn't last very long at all uh, under his command. But if you did accept that challenge, if you did want responsibility, if you did want to, uh, to meet his standards of perfection, you had tremendous opportunity, tremendous opportunity. And, and it bred such loyalty. These people who worked for him could go out into industry and instantly triple their income. Some people came in and took pay cuts in order to work for him. And these people stayed with him. His principal people stayed with him for decades, stayed with him for decades. He bred such loyalty. But outside of naval reactors, among the, uh, the wider Navy, uh, the Pentagon, uh, the, um, uh, and the contractors, he was despised. He was yeah. despised. And, yeah. you know, he, he was absolutely ruthless. And you can understand why they hated him. He, uh, there was one point uh, a, during the Korean War. So we're in, we're in a war and he's cornered the market uh, on stainless steel. And the, the um, Pentagon is looking for stainless steel to build aircrafts. And, uh, uh, and they're gonna come to him and ask for, for some of his stainless steel. And he said, over my dead body, they're gonna have to go out and find it themselves. And he, he said, the reason I fight so hard all the time is because do you think when they come and say, we've got to cut budgets, that they're gonna cut my budget? No, they're not gonna cut my budget because they know how hard I'm gonna fight them. And they're gonna to have to be ready to go to the mat with me. You know, so people outside of naval reactors disliked him. The contractors, he squeezed them. He spied on them. He had people, he stationed his people at the Navy yards around the country that were building his ships and building his, and the factories, the laboratories that were building his reactors. Uh, he had his people, they were known as Rickover spies. And their whole job was to be there and make sure they were fulfilling their contracts with the Navy. Could you, uh, could you tell us uh, just, because I'm sure most people don't know this, when uh, they were testing each new sub, uh, who had to go, go with the sub and what was the likely consequence yeah. of that type of quality mm -hmm. control measure? Yeah. So when a sub is being taken uh, over by the Navy before it's officially uh, commissioned into the Navy, it undergoes, or the sub or any ship, it undergoes sea trials. Now, before Rickover, this was a, a purely naval affair. Um, Rickover insisted, and it, in fact, I uh, heard last night, it continues to this day. The manager of the, sh of the shipyard, along with Rickover, that built, went the, that built out, the vessel that built the vessel, went out, had to go out on that, on that sub, on that ship for its very first sea trial. You are talking, Die. you were- It had to, when it, it's going down, you're going down with us, sir. So yeah. come ahead, come aboard. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, essentially Rickover said, either it comes off, off uh, out to sea 
ready to go, or you may die on this boat. And he was prepared to die on the boat too, because he knew uh, what was going on in those yards. He certainly did. Um, there's so many um, paradoxes about him, but um, so he, he could be um, in some ways such a scoundrel and in other ways such a hero. I mean, if you look in terms of, I, I don't believe there was anybody else that could have done this. It had to be Rickover and only Rickover who could have with all this force of personality and strategy and tactics was able to manipulate the system in order to produce the quality of submarines at a transformative period that mm -hmm. otherwise never would have happened. But so he was, he did a lot of things that were, that were, were unsettling or infuriating, but the, in some sense, the purpose of it was, was really sincere and pure. Um, mm -hmm. He was a bit of a hero at times. Uh, I read in your book when he, about when he was on a, sub, a diesel boat early in his mm -hmm. career, Mm -hmm. that he saved with an act of heroism. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, he 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 did not lack for physical courage for all. He may have been small, but um, he was tough. And, he, um, you know, one of the things and, and I think we should probably uh, pretty soon move to to the slideshow. Um, but, um, you know, he. Uh, he always insisted that you had to get the job done. And, you know, maybe what I'll do is end, end our conversation with just a quick quote. Uh, it's a fairly famous one from him. Uh, we barely scratched the surface of his uh, philosophy, um, but he said, responsibility is a unique concept. You may share it with others, but your portion is not diminished. You may delegate it, but it is still with you. If responsibility is rightfully yours, no evasion or ignorance or passing the blame can shift the burden to someone else. Unless you can point your finger at the man who is responsible when something goes wrong, then you have never had anyone really responsible. And Rickover took responsibility for everything he ever did and said, if this is, if I always uh, acted as if this was the only job I would ever have, you know, and that was the fire that drove him. So, um, you know, so uh, uh, Lauren is showing a few slides here. This is, this is the uh, marketplace of the shtetl in uh, Macau in Poland, where he came from. Um, you can see it was rough beginnings. We can look at the next slide. Are you not seeing the next slide? Now I see the next slide. Okay, okay. and this is the ship's manifest. You can see over on the left-hand side, uh, Reichel, uh, Feige, and Chaim Reichauer. Um, about midway down the page, and it's sort of scratched out or stamped over, but there's a stamp there that says on the three names, deported. And then um, uh, I think the other stamp indicates that they overrode, overrode the de uh, deportation order uh, because um, her husband had arrived. We can look at the next. So this is this is Rick Over's graduation photo at the Naval Academy. Uh, there's a famous story about uh, what happened with the yearbook. You can uh, read that in in my book. Um, but uh, uh, this is this is his photograph at uh, age 22. So uh, this is the um, what what atomic energy meant to people at the end of World War II. This is the explosion uh, that uh, uh, decimated uh, Nagasaki. 
And Rick Over was intent on sticking it into a little container and inside a submarine. It was uh, uh, an extraordinary thing to, to even contemplate. Are you seeing the next photo? Uh, not yet. Hmm. Oh, you did for a second there. Which one are you seeing? I'm seeing still uh, Rick over with the cutaway of the submarine. Okay, there we go. So this is um, this is a land submarine that he had built out in the high desert wastes of of Idaho, and that was the Kitty Hawk moment of nuclear energy. Was when inside there, the the first there's a reactor inside there, and they used that reactor to drive a propeller or the equivalent of of a propeller. Um, which was uh, in 1953. Uh, up until that point, all the reactors in the world were experimental reactors. They were large. They were, uh, and all the only thing that had ever been done before then was to light a few light bulbs for a brief uh, for brief seconds. And here he began to turn uh, the equivalent of a propeller, and they drove it uh, the equivalent of a cross Atlantic transatlantic crossing. Um, the uh, engineers he worked with, talking about uh, Rick Over's bravery, the engineers he was working with, they suggested that they should uh, start it up remotely because they didn't know if it was going to work. They didn't know if it was going to become a bomb, if it was going to melt down. They weren't certain. And they said, let's start it remotely. And he insisted that they do it uh, right there, that they handled the throttle themselves. So uh, simultaneous with uh, the development of that uh, uh, land-based um, submarine, he was developing the Nautilus uh, in Groton, Connecticut uh, at uh, Electric Boat uh, and put uh, a, a nuclear reactor inside a, a standard diesel submarine hull. Um, we, can, and, can, can we just emphasize the point that you just made? simultaneously, that yeah. is not how the Navy does things or industry does things. You don't do them simultaneously. You finish with one and then start with the other. Is that right? Yeah. Well, it, it, when you think about that timeline from the time he got the power uh, uh, to uh, build the nuclear reactor and build this, uh, build this up to the time he uh, it, uh, uh, was launched, was uh, four years, five years actually, but which is an incredibly short timeline. You know, things of course operated in a different way then uh, it would be impossible to, it, it takes uh, five years to, from contract to uh, finish now to, to just get a sub off the ways. I, I, just, I just want to say this, this one thing that while there are there have been a number of directors of Navy nuclear reactors since uh, Admiral Rickover, and their personalities are markedly different from his. I'm thinking of one in in particular, uh, Admiral DeMars, um, uh, and so they maintain these standards of excellence and safety and um, and competence. Um, but I I still think and uh, that um, at this time that you're talking about now, the only person who could have made all this come about originally, not continue it, but make it happen mm -hmm. was Admiral Hyman Rickover. Well, the Navy uh, disagreed highly. They were trying <laughs> to force him into retirement. Uh, <laughs> And, and uh, there are time and again. Um, this is so simultaneous with, with the land sub, the Nautilus, he was developing the first civilian uh, atomic utility. Uh, this was at the time the largest metal casting uh, ever, uh, ever done. And this was the, the, the reactor vessel for that, um, that utility in, uh, uh, in Pennsylvania. 
So all of this uh, resulted in uh, great fame for Rickover. Um, he was, you know, uh, his son told me that uh, he really didn't realize how what a big deal his father w had become until he was on the cover of Time magazine, you know, which at that at that time was sort of the ultimate in um, in fame. He was um, he was denied promotion to admiral, and normally you would be forced out of the navy when you were denied promotion. Um, but as you find out in the book, uh, he went to extraordinary lengths and others went to extraordinary lengths, sort of unbelievable lengths to get him his promotion. And this is uh, a photograph around um, the time that he became a rear admiral. So there's, so, and he wound up with four stars with, yeah. and, there, and there are no fives anymore, not since World War II. There mm -hmm. are the highest you can go and yeah. he made it to four with the help yeah. of Congress. Yeah, and, and we should say that this was a guy who was the leader of a fourth echelon department within the Navy Bureau of Ships. This was not somebody who was in the E-ring of the Pentagon. This was not somebody who was even close to the um, chief of Naval Operations uh, offices at the Pentagon. Uh, and yet one CNO said, you folks may think I'm the, uh, the head of the Navy, but I work for Rick like everybody else. And, um, and nowadays they do, they require that the head of, of Naval reactors be a four-star admiral uh, uh, because uh, the head of Naval reactors can st overrule ship operations. And this was something that uh, Rick over set up because this is the way to keep reactors safe. Uh, and after uh, the Nautilus sailed under the polar ice cap, uh, it was brought to New York City for a celebration. Rick Over, as you'll uh, read in the book, was snubbed uh, at the White House for the, uh, uh, when they announced this extraordinary achievement, which was uh, in its way uh, as, Big a deal as the landing on the moon would be in ten in another decade. Um, but and landing on the moon was not the consequence of one person's audacity and tenacity. Yeah, but yeah. this project was. Yeah, and here you can see uh, Jack Kennedy, uh, President Kennedy, uh, looking at a, a lo underseas launch of a Polaris missile. And when he saw that, he said, this is, this, is, this is what our power is now based on. And he uh, authorized a, a, a massive building program um, that uh, resulted in, even at its, at its height though, uh, Rickover controlled only about uh, a third of the ships in the Navy. He had, he had about 120 ships, uh, ships and boats. Uh, that were nuclear, um, but from that position, he controlled the entire Navy. Uh, this included the first carrier, uh, a nuclear carrier, the uh, Enterprise, uh, and they sent an all nuclear task force around the, uh, the, to circumnavigate the world. They went, uh, it was sort of a, a showpiece, kind of like um, Teddy Roosevelt's white Navy um, that he sent around the world. Uh, back uh, uh, back around the turn of the century, um, and uh, this was this was uh, an extraordinary thing. They never needed to be refueled. Those are sailors there laying out E equals M C squared. His power uh, emanated from his friends on Capitol Hill. You can see him here with uh, Senator Leverett uh, Sultan Stall on the far left. Uh, and of course, Lyndon Johnson, the master of the Senate there in this, the center. Uh, Rick Over was up, up on Capitol Hill to testify, of course, in civilian clothing. Rick Over was eventually welcomed into the White House. Here he was with uh, John Kennedy uh, at the White House. They actually spent much of their conversation talking about education. 
Uh, we barely scratched the surface of what Rick Over did in education. He wrote four books on education. He was, uh, he was obsessed with education, particularly technology and science education, engineering and science, um, and had many theories of education, um, which uh, in fact, although not, not um, uh, through him, were eventually implemented. Um, but really the apotheosis of Rick Over's career was when Jimmy Carter was a nuclear submarine officer was elected uh, to the White House. Uh, Jimmy Carter uh, wrote a campaign biography, uh, his autobiography called Why Not the Best? And that was based on a question uh, that Rick Over asked him during his uh, interview to become a nuclear uh, power uh, school candidate. Um, and uh, it, he said, no man had more influence on my life than, uh, except for my father, other than, uh, uh, other than Rick Over. And here they I, are, well, can, I'm sorry. So I, I just think it's, it's interesting to, to note. I mean, everybody's aware of how much a man of faith Jimmy Carter is, but he came pretty close to um, some kind of, I, and I don't mean, want this to be taken too too far. Some kind of a blasphemous blasphemous statement when he uh, said of Hyman Rickover that uh, he Jimmy Carter considered him omniscient, omnipresent, and omni omnipotent. Yeah. I mean, those are terms that are typically reserved for deity. Uh, yeah. which gives you some sense of the um, awe in which Jimmy Carter held Admiral Rickover. Yeah, yeah, he brought him into the White House as a confidant and mentor. Uh, he said, uh, I never really felt that Rickover thought of me as his boss. You know, this <laughs> is the commander in chief. Um, but, uh, but they became very close. Rickover advised him on, uh, on a number of matters. Uh, they rarely discussed naval policy. Uh, that was okay with Rickover, um, even though he was fighting Carter to get a uh, another uh, nuclear carrier built. Uh, next, to, next to Rosalind in that previous picture was Eleanor Rickover, um, mm -hmm. uh, the second Mrs. Rickover, um, yeah. who uh, was a, a Navy nurse, career Navy nurse, and was a uh, real. Um, power in her own right. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I don't know whether I should tell this story or not of the day that um, uh, Admiral Rickover died and I was in the Rickover home sitting next to Mrs. Rickover and the phone rang and it was an aide to President Carter. And uh, he said, um, President Carter, former President Carter wanted to speak to Mrs. Rickover. And I immediately passed the phone and he wanted to um, come to the burial, which took place before the Navy's farewell formal memorial service for Admiral Rickover. She, he wanted to come to the, to the burial in Arlington and Mrs. Rickover had decided that only uh, immediate family and a few others would be there. I had the privilege of conducting um, the ceremony um, with the Navy Chief of Chaplains, uh, Admiral McNamara, and um, he asked to be there and she said to him words that are still ringing in my head um, nicely. She said, no, Jimmy, I'm sorry, it's private. Uh, to the former president of the United States, he did wind up giving one of the three eulogies at the Navy's farewell to yeah. Admiral Rickover. Yeah. Um, Rick Over, um, you, Bruce, you um, you were the one who who convinced me that Rick Over remained a Jew. Uh, yeah. People in the Navy believed he had converted. Yeah. Uh, but perhaps you could say just a couple words about that, and then uh, maybe we can, uh, if we have time, uh, turn to questions. So. Um, um, Admiral, Admiral Rickover um, uh, 
studied Jewish ethics and uh, read books about Jewishness uh, throughout his life. He didn't um, practice in any public manner uh, his Jewishness on the mantle of uh, the fireplace in his home uh, was a sculpture that he had received from the B'nai B'rith Klutznik Museum. Um, I talked with Mrs. Rickover about his uh, the assumption that the Admiral had converted somewhere along the way um, to Episcopalianism or, some, or Christianity, some other form of Christianity. She said, absolutely not, that he was Jewish uh, to the end of his life. In the last book, when he could no longer read, the last book that she was reading to him uh, before he died was uh, about uh, the Holocaust in Poland. Um, and so there was no, and she insisted that his, that his uh, burial service be a Jewish burial service. And, um, and I took care of that. Um, the Navy's farewell was held at the, at the, um, at the Washington National Cathedral because as the Admiral in charge said to me, I recommended Washington Hebrew congregation, um, but as the Admiral in charge said to me, uh, the, uh, the Navy, um, the Navy um, uh, memorializes its own at the cathedral. Are you on board, Chaplain? And I said, I wanted a rabbi to be there. So I said, yes, sir. And um, so that's where it was held. And uh, um, not the only Navy Admiral uh, that whose funeral service was held at the National Cathedral for the same reason. The Navy says goodbye to its own at the National Cathedral. Um, uh, Navy CNO Borda, Admiral Borda also who was Jewish, had the Navy had his farewell at the National Cathedral too. Yeah. Okay. We have quite a few questions. We won't get to all of them, but um, we can, uh, address some. Um, the, uh, the first question, you mentioned that you talked with his son. This question is, is his son still alive? And had you talked with him if you wanted to say a few words about that? Yeah. Um, yes, his son is still alive, Robert, um, and uh, a, a very nice man. Uh, Robert, uh, they, had, they had an unusual relationship, uh, I have to say. Um, uh, uh, Rickover was a busy, busy man, and he was on the road all the time. He uh, he ran this uh, this empire, and he ran it uh, in a in a singular way, which you can read about in the book. But it required him to be he would uh, typically uh, travel overnight so that he would arrive uh, to work first thing in the morning uh, at whatever far flung place it was, Pittsburgh. Chicago, uh, Connecticut, uh, uh, or Idaho, and then uh, get travel again the next uh, in the night so he could get to his next place. So, you know, uh, as a, a youngster, uh, Robert, who was born in 1940, I don't think he saw a great deal of his father. He said that when he was there, they often took walks through Rock Creek Park together and talked about anything. Uh, they didn't have a television in their house. Um, Rickover's wife, uh, first wife who uh, died, um, uh, was in many ways smarter than Rickover himself. <laughs> she, uh, she was a, a brilliant legal scholar. They wrote um, articles and books together. Um, but uh, Robert, um, that there clearly had to have been some level of estrangement between father and son. Um, because uh, my understanding is that he did not attend the burial or the memorial service. Um, and, um, you know, so, so it's, a, it's, it's a little bit hard for me to understand, but whenever I spoke with him, he spoke very fondly of his father. He, he spoke with, with a lot of admiration. So, um, you know, uh, I, it's, it's something, you know, we all have, um, complex relationships with our parents um, that can be both uh, loving and to some degree estranged at times. So, you know, that, that was my sense. 
Did you another, also... another little piece of that is that uh, there was a soft side to Hyman Rickover. Um, I, Mrs. Rickover showed me um, parts of the 99 notebooks of his writings and favorite quotes that had, he had put together. And in there were love poems to mm. Eleanor Rickover, which were extraordinarily well done and so touching. And she, by the way, was an angel, uh, in my view, on earth. She was a Navy nurse. And in, when she retired, she just always continued to help people left, right, and sideways throughout the rest of her life. Uh, Mark, did you interview President Jimmy Carter for the book? You know, I reached out to uh, President Carter uh, and he uh, did not make himself available for it. Um, you know, which uh, the, the word I got back was essentially that He's busy and his health is, is not great. But um, the Carter Center, when uh, even before the book came out, asked that I uh, send a copy to uh, President Carter's grandson to, to get to him. Uh, the president was, uh, President Carter was uh, eager to read it. Uh, I have not heard the reaction from him uh, to the book. Um, I'm hoping eventually to go uh, talk about Rick over at the Carter Center. Uh, and I'm sure hoping that uh, President Carter remains in, in good health and continues to contribute in all sorts of ways. Um, there were a few questions about his Judaism and anti-Semitism, which I think you then went on to answer uh, during your talk. So let's move on. Um, while Admiral Rickover was absolutely in charge in terms of the Nautilus, how much of the implementation and design was done not by the Navy, but by civilian employees at the Bettis Nuclear Power Lab? Yeah, that's that's a good question. And you know, Rickover had a policy that the design work was done at uh, at uh, naval reactors, and that then, when contracted, the 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 contractors had to meet their specifications uh, to the letter. And um, he had his, his spies out there to make sure they were doing it exactly right. The contractors eventually got very upset because he would often in midstream would change the, uh, the specifications, which had, uh, you know, you can't just sort of remove one thing and not have a, it, it affect all sorts of other things on the ship. You know, everything about a ship is interconnected, ship or a boat. Um, but, uh, but he, of course, was working with engineers who had to implement what, uh, what, they, uh, what was uh, uh, designed at naval reactors. And uh, you know, that involved a tremendous amount of in engineering. Bettis was a, a huge, uh, huge, huge facility. Bettis is uh, the Westinghouse facility. Um, uh, General Electric had its own um, nuclear reactor facility at Knowles. Um, and, you know, in each instance, um, the, they had to do an enormous amount of development work to accomplish what the design work that came out of naval reactors. Um, and you're talking about thousands and thousands of, of engineers. Um, you know, it was really a, an extraordinary empire that, that Rick Dover built. Um, can you talk about his personal involvement in picking the nuclear officers? I know one officer who was told by the ADM to stand in the closet for getting a question wrong. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. so um, I have I have a, a whole chapter on this process. Um, uh, I, I, I was delighted the first time I spoke with Bruce that he, um, although a sad occasion, but he sat down on a famous chair um, you know, which um, uh, there, there's a chair uh, that Rick overhead where he had his midshipmen, uh, the midshipmen come in or the ROTC officer candidates come in for their interviews. And it was, the legs were cut short in front and they would promptly start to slide to the floor and they would be off balance as he immediately started peppering them with questions and they had to answer. And even before they got an answer out, he had another question at them and then another and then another. And they were crazy questions. They were at, he was asking them, uh, you know, did, uh, uh, has a woman ever said you're good looking? You know, has a woman ever said you're ugly? What would, uh, you know, explain religion to me? 
uh, tell me what, you know, what are the last 10 books you've read and uh, tell me about them. And, uh, and he would start yelling at them. Now, uh, and if he didn't get the right answer, the answer that he wanted to hear, and these are terrified, you know, 22 year old uh, Naval Academy senior midshipmen, you know, uh, he, or in some cases, veteran officers yes. who are co coming there to get commands and he would berate them. And then if he didn't get the right answer, he would banish them to a broom closet and they would sit there literally in a broom closet for hours in some cases. And for some of the people who were sent there, this was this ended up being a moment of epiphany where they thought about their lives and what they had been doing and they under and they came to understand what he was after. And for others of them, uh, one of them in particular that I'm thinking of is uh, uh, Elmo Zumwalt, who was later the uh, uh, CNO of the Navy, the Chief of Naval Operations and, and uh, multi-star admiral in his own right. And he went in, he was a veteran of World War II. He had had ship command. He was uh, uh, a heroic figure, uh, uh, had graduated near the top of his class in the Navy. And when Rickover banished him for the third time uh, to the broom closet, he almost blew his stack. And he said, I don't want this. <laughs> and and uh, you know, he uh, Rickover offered him after that, offered him uh, power school, nuclear power school uh, uh, opportunity, and he rejected it. And this was uh, the beginning. Once uh, Zumo became CNO, they had terrible fights. Um, how I was uh, I was I was in um, in the Rickover home making uh, notes the day the admiral died, and I and I uh, I sat down in this chair, brown brown wooden chair, very slick surface, as was described with the front legs cut two inches short. And uh, as soon as I sat down, uh, I slid. I was in my whites my summer whites and I slid off the chair and onto the floor. So it was not easy to keep your place sitting in that chair. And I looked up at Chief of Chaplains Admiral McNamara and I said, I know what chair this is. And that was the chair. It was a tough chair to sit in. Yeah. And that was without somebody sitting there peppering you with questions right. <laughs> and, and screaming at you with, uh, with the, the stars of, of, of an right. admiral. How is Rickover regarded today at Annapolis? Um, very good question. Uh, Rickover, you know, uh, and I'll even talk, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the wider Navy as well. So there is a, uh, a when Rickover uh, brought that revolution from inside the Navy that transformed the Naval Academy from a finishing school for officers into uh, a, a Polytechnic Institute that uh, a naval MIT, some call it, um, there, uh, the first large engineering laboratory building that was built was named Rickover Hall. And there, um, and every, uh, every midshipman at some point spends time in Rickover Hall. Um, he is thought of within the Navy with two sides. One side is by God, we have these boats, uh, uh, nuclear powered boats and ships because of Rickover and that made the Navy and that uh, won the Cold War and that um, has protected the United States for all these years. And there's another side that says he broke the Navy. He broke the Navy with, uh, by creating essentially uh, technology specialists. And it spread throughout the Navy that every discipline within the Navy is its own silo. And uh, that there are uh, technological specialties that don't touch each other. And so uh, where there was once a whole Navy, uh, now there, is, there are uh, different components of the Navy. There's still a whole Navy. But yeah, uh, yes, Rabbi. No, I, I couldn't, I cannot buy into the latter point of view. And I have to say this, that 
uh, if the standards for training and excellence and, um, and uh, on the job performance were uh, according to Rickover standards, our Navy would be vastly more superior uh, to all the navies of the world, the other navies of the world, than is currently the case. And the kinds of accidents that we've had because of poor training and insufficient um, and, and, and inf insufficient numbers of personnel like we had with the accident that the ship McCain was in not too terribly long ago, those kinds of things would not flat out not be happening. The loss, I mean, the Navy's a great, great, great organization and branch of uh, the uniformed services, but it is not meeting the standards that Admiral Rickover established and where and we need to be. Um, a couple of people are asking which was the president that snubbed Rickover. Snubbed Rickover. Um, that yeah. invite him passed passed over him. It must have been something you who did not invite him to the White House for the Nautilus ceremony. Oh, um, well, it wasn't the president, actually, in that case. Uh, so this was under Dwight Eisenhower. And there was a, um, uh, a, a deputy chief of uh, naval operations, an admiral, who hated Rickover. He said, uh, uh, I'd like to get him in a dark alley and have a knife with me. Um, and so when the Nautilus uh, uh, achieved this extraordinary uh, uh, thing of, of transiting the, the, the beneath the polar ice cap, uh, President Eisenhower invited uh, the, all the principals who were involved um, to, come, uh, to come for the press conference, including their wives. Um, the one person the Navy did not reach out to was Admiral Rickover. So it was really, a, it was actually a direct snub by the Navy. And uh, Rickover, uh, we sh I should say, as soon, uh, as, soon as his uh, friends on Capitol Hill got wind of it, they gave him a medal, his second Legion of Merit. Um, only Zachary Taylor, General Zachary Taylor uh, uh, in American history had ever received it twice. And um, uh, President Eisenhower promptly gave him his second star. So uh, in the end, Rickover came out far more powerful. And that seemed to be the way he worked. You know, he got into fights. And in the end, he came out more powerful. Uh, well, we're coming up on 8 o'clock here. So why don't we finish yeah. the question? How did you happen to decide to write this book about Admiral Rickover? Yeah, um, that's uh, thanks for that question. So um, I'd uh, always been uh, interested in military history. I had written uh, an earlier book about uh, pioneering av uh, naval aviators in World War I, the Millionaires Unit. Um, and uh, I knew some things about Rickover, but I didn't know enough. And I was interested in him. And I spoke with the people at, at uh, the editor of Jewish Lives. And um, I had actually uh, proposed as well my, uh, my other great love, baseball, and said, how about a book about Sandy Koufax? And she wasn't interested in that from me. But, um, but she said they'd, they'd like a book on Rickover. Um, and it actually led me down a road that really surprised me because uh, you know, I knew he was controversial. I knew that he um, had uh, gone through stormy seas, his, and I knew, of course, that he had managed to to hold on to power and remain in the Navy for for uh, uh, sixty three years. You know, I knew all those basic outlines, but I didn't know just what a uh, both a complex and well rounded man he was. This was a guy who gave philosophical addresses, who, who wrote about education in serious learned ways. Uh, when you read his testimony on Capitol Hill, he would range from uh, the ancient Greeks uh, through, the, uh, through Hinduism, 
uh, he would talk about uh, the, the, the rise and fall of great empires. Uh, he would talk about uh, the, uh, the elements that went into making command decisions. Um, and he would spend uh, much of his time deriding the Navy and the bureaucrats at the Pentagon and the Defense Department. Uh, he said, uh, and uh, test me one time, he said, I don't have any idea why we have a Department of Defense. I don't know what they do. I have no idea why they exist at all. You know, so, you know, once I started poking into that stuff, I just said, you know, I'm not, I, uh, I respect to, to the ends of the earth, the, uh, the people in the services I've met. Um, and, uh, but I, I was never in the service, but uh, this was a chance for me to explore somebody who um, uh, could recite Milton and uh, knew his, uh, the, the inner workings of a nuclear reactor. And that was, that was just a privilege. It was such a privilege and, and a lot of fun. You know, Rick Over could also be very, very funny and uh, uh, in a very biting way. And so we, it was- we only, scratched, we only scratched the surface of this great book. Hmm. You've yeah, got to go you. get it and read it. You will yeah. enjoy it immensely. And I Thank did you. put the link in the chat to the discounted uh, book uh, with free shipping. And you also should have gotten that in your email. So I highly recommend that if you'd like to learn more, please do purchase the book. Uh, thank you both very much. This was fascinating. And thanks to all of you for joining in and have a great evening, everybody. Yeah, thanks to everybody for all your patience and for listening to us. Good night. Good night. Good night. Goodbye. Good night. Bye-bye.